Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round interview show. Now, today I'm joined by a really interesting person, a person that's coached all over the world and as well had success following to pretty much everywhere that he's been. And to add to some of that international flavor, uh, a person that's coached two countries in two different sports at the same time, none other than former Wallabies coach, former Pumas coach, Michael Checker. James, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm really excited to to get into this conversation with you, even just talking off there. It, it, you've got plenty of, of wisdom to pass on, some great stories. Uh, the World Cup recently finished. Mm -hmm. You're based in Paris. Do you, do you mind just sharing with the listeners what you're doing back here in Australia? Because I, did, I didn't know that you're actually living full-time in Paris. Yeah, yeah, no, so we've been over there for two and a bit years. Uh, <clears throat> originally, you know, I think it was just an opportunity. My kids always sent them to French school here in Australia. There's a French school out at Ramwick, which is our sort of home base, Coogee on born and bred there. I think just have another language under their belt, learn something different. So there was a good opportunity to do that and then do some work over there. I sort of went over there originally consulting. I was assisting with um, uh, the Pumas at the time, just helping him, my mate Mario who coached with me in Australia, Ledesma, who coached the Wallabies with me. And then uh, we moved, made the move over there and, and then from there the Pumas position came up and Mario left. So it was, it was quite good because the majority of the players are playing their rugby over there, the Pumas players in either France or England or in Scotland. Um, or in Italy. So it was a good way for me to stay in touch with them while also coaching the team. So, yeah, and then the World Cup was there as well. So that was a good, you know, good opportunity to sort of be based there. And now um, I've just come back here for a week to, you know, check out a few things and got the invite to come on and have a chat with you. So I'd always take the time. <laughs> well, well, thank you. We're, we're delighted to have you on. And um, Before we get into the, the Argentinian campaign, can you tell us about the sense of occasion that was happening in France with the, the Rugby Union World Cup yeah. because, you know, the optics of it, it looked amazing, it looked important, it looked special and it looked like something you'd want to be a part of. Yeah, oh, it's, it is. It's a special event, you know, and I think it's – there's just something about the – you know, when I'm talking about it now, you start to get the the feelings. And when I've had three experiences at the Rugby World Cup and one at the league, you know, even just that, that whole thing of um, – of the sense of occasion, how the supporters come, they're there. 215 with Australia, you know, there was a huge supporter base that came over and we made the run to the final. Uh, this one here, the Argentinian supporter base was just amazing, you know what I mean, for the way they travel to support both in football and, and then in rugby. And, you know, the anthems before the games, the the, the crowd, it's, it's something special. And France is a really good place for the World Cup because... It's a great place to hang out, obviously, for the supporters in between games. You know, they can go to anywhere from the Côte d'Azur to the wine country, the champagne country, Paris. You know, you could be you could be any up in the mountains. It's the it's a fantastic place. So there's so much going on in between the games, which we probably didn't see as much of. But then on game day, the fans were ripe, like they were. It, there was so much action, so much excitement, and you can't help it. World Cup, it's the pinnacle of the sport, and and uh, it's so enjoyable to be a part of. Yeah, and obviously, um, in most of the European countries, France, France especially, soccer dominates. But it, did it feel as if rugby union was starting to to get some some more attention and, and even dominate the, the the back pages of of the French press? Well, without a doubt, especially with France, have had a a quality team as well and were highly fancied. But I think in France there's a, there's a unique thing where rugby's become very very popular. It's probably of the European nations that have rugby and football, of soccer, that the, it's the one where rugby's probably highest pitched against football, right, whereas in the UK obviously soccer's so so dominant. Um, in Italy and, you know, the the... the it's just got... There's a certain passion it, it, and obviously... Feeling about rugby based its its historical roots there in the south, right? But it takes over the country um, at a World Cup. There's a World Cup in 07, um, and then you know they've got fantastic stadiums there. The crowd are are, are very passionate. It's one of the few places where it, the the games they'll 
the crowd will sing the anthem as a as a song in the game, you know, oh, I mean, not yes. just the anthem at the on match day. And in many of the games where the French crowds were there and France weren't playing, you'd hear the Marseillaise start being sung throughout the crowd, you know. So um, they were heavily favoured. They went out in the quarters, but it's it was an amazing atmosphere. And I think uh, there's there's really nothing quite like that pinnacle tournament, you know, to be involved in. Yeah, I think it's a, a real um, a, a crown in in rugby union, especially when when you look at the the two codes, the, their World Cup, like it's yeah, it, it, it's amazing, and and even having it in a country like France, that there seems a real. Um, level of patriotism yeah. as well. Like everyone's proud to be French. They're, they're proud that they're, mm. they're showcasing this to the world. They're yeah. putting on the show to the world to say, look how French we yeah. are, how much it means to us to be French. Even like you say, in the non-French, or the, the teams where France weren't participating, yeah. they still wanted to be seen and be heard that they're they're. France are here. Well, mate, they had the, um, in the Place de la Concorde in, in Paris, which is like right in the centre of town, just up from the Louvre, there was a massive a fan zone where you could go watch the games and it was huge and it was packed, you know, every night. So the, the games went, especially obviously when France were playing, but um, the, there was a real fever about it up there. It was so good to be. We were in a, early on we were based out, in a quieter place, which was fantastic, called Le Ball, which was sort of Brittany. And then we moved down to Marseille. Things started to heat up then as far as crowd action was concerned. We played a few games in Nantes um, and then we went to Paris for the semis and the, the third, fourth place game. So we got a really good piece of uh, action from all around, you know. But it was a, it was a great experience. Yeah, it, it certainly came across that way. And I know speaking to, to people back home, they, they said that, you know, it was dominating the headlines and, and looked like a real, like a, the sense of occasion. Yeah, I think different. you get the different nationalities too, which really makes it. Big crowds came. Like Argentina had a huge support there, mainly for the their last pool games in the quarterfinal. You know, that's where people come. They spend their money. They come on in their big groups. Chile from South America. It's the first time ever World Cup had three South American teams. So Chile and Uruguay, so there's also a big South American flavour. And then, of course, the English were able to come over en masse, you know, even just on the weekends, you know, for their games. The Irish, huge, you know, when they were they came out, um, you know, they, they made their, their – they make an impression off the field. So the, <laughs> all that national fervour that yeah. comes with the supporters coming across and getting in, and they make the tournament just as much as the games, you know, because all of that off-field action is, is part of what, you know, the buzz – of coming into the stadium when the people are getting ready for a big test match and a World Cup is electric. Yeah, it, it certainly, like I say, it, it certainly looked that way. But but onto Argentina's um, campaign, um, it was a very successful couple of years, I believe. In that time, obviously, make the world make a World Cup semi final, uh, beat New Zealand. Is that was that the first time? First time I beat New Zealand was in 2020 when we were when I was here helping yeah. with Mario, and then we beat them in New Zealand for the first time ever in Christchurch. That was in 22, or I think, yeah. And also beat Australia along the Australia. way, not for the first time, but yeah, that was that was and another we had win. Another win with Australia. So we had it. It was a good um, couple of years around our results. We would have liked. I really feel like we know we didn't have the most talented team, like obviously in the world. We worked really hard. On some of the things we knew we could do, we could do well. Uh, I would have loved to have won that last game. You know, the third, fourth place. I know it's 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 the second place. Well, it's the it's the the bronze know, the, medal yeah, match. Yeah. match. But for us, that was huge, and we we had it in our grasp. You know, we let a charge down through in the end, and you know, it was for those players, it would have meant a lot because that's the highest Argentina would have ever finished. You know, but I feel like for for where. We, the Argentinian players are playing their northern hem- they're, they're playing their club rugby in the northern hemisphere and their international rugby in the southern hemisphere, which is extremely tricky because there's not many breaks for them. You know, they don't get a chance to have rests, pre-season, build up. So we made a really tailor-made program to get ourselves right for this tournament. We took a few risks in the lead up with players, making sure that we didn't play them and and what we got from another guy stepped in and I felt like everyone played their part and we got 
maybe not as far as we wanted to go, but we got a really good long way there. And and um, the atmosphere inside of the team was was fantastic. We had a great um, blend of older players through down to younger players. During this year and well, the lead up to the World Cup, we got our first players that passed 100 caps, the first two ever for Argentina, in August and Crivia, Nicolas Sanchez. And those players who were so experienced were playing a really huge role from us from the bench. So th- it was a there was a really good collaboration going on there. You know when you, you've been in them, teams are feeling good about themselves. And even though we didn't start the tournament tournament well, we were able to stay in there and and uh, – and, and handled our emotions really well to get ourselves through. But, well, you, you speak of emotions. Um, it, it, it seems just sitting across from you, there's a real connection mm. to, to this team. Uh, so, so why then d- decide to voluntarily, I believe, walk away? Well, look, the the original plan was that a, with my coaching team there, I had Felipe Contempomi, who I'd coached at Leinster in Ireland for five years, great five eight. He'd been captain of the national team. They wanted to bring him back and give him the role. So what we did was he came back as an assistant and his, the plan was that he would go into the head coach's role this year in 24. So that was the, the plan. Now, as things went better, there was the, and we went well, there was the idea that we could keep it going together. And I think we talk, I went to Argentina and we talked about it. I had a very good relationship with the union there and with, the, with, the other, with Felipe and... We had a good talk about how it would work if I stayed because, you know, there can only be one boss in the team, right? So I, I really wanted to gauge where he was at around did he really – did he really – how much was he prepared to – because that balance had to be right, you yeah. know what I mean, I think. And I after going through it and, you know, obviously then there's financial considerations as well from the union, what they, what they could and can't do, I think – they had a plan. The plan went well. Let's stick to the plan and then see where that goes for the future. And it was tr- it was tough because, like I said, I was emotionally connected, obviously, and still am. You know, so you can tell. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it was, it was a great, great place, great country, great people, mate. The the living, well, being there, they've got a lot of problems economically, but they live in a certain way that is so enjoyable to be a part of and their, the crowd were fantastic, you know. So I've, all the way, I've always had a strong connection with Argentina. They spoke to me about coaching them before I became the Australian coach in, in 15 um, <clears throat> and and uh, and I've had that long connection with through coaching a lot of their players. So I've got, I've got a strong connection there and I always will have, you know. Yeah, well, I, I want to actually get stuck into you about um, the, the rise of – Argentina, not too dissimilar to the rise of Japan, the rise of Italy. So, when I was a when I was a boy, mm. you'd laugh if you heard Argentina or Japan or Italy playing rugby. Yeah, you'd laugh. Now it was around about ninety nine. Argentina started to make some progression. What what's behind that? How, how does a country go from being almost you know, a laughing stock where people would say like, oh, if they ever, they imagine saying ni- in 95 that Argentina will make a, a semi-final in yeah. the next 30 years, 40 yeah. years, whatever it may be. You'd, you'd think someone was joking. Yeah, well, and now I think in the, if you look at Argentina, they made semi-final in 07, in yeah. 15, Australia, we beat them in 15, and then again in 23, which is a fantastic record. And, mate, I'll tell you this, that... Their club rugby atmosphere there, it's 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 um, it's contagious. There's a club scene in all the different provinces, which has been built organically from the ground up, right? That the players, so the international players will come get a chance, they all play in Europe, they come back to Argentina for a camp, they're straight out to their clubs, watching the games on the weekend or at training or having a barbecue, because you know, barbecues, that's it. You know, the asado, everyone's having one. So and that that passion for the game is built from their club life, like how how strong the connections are in the community from the club they played for when they were young, and that's created players that have been able to get a look in on the international scene and then been brought into bigger competitions and improve the national team. But the hub of their of how you can have 
a sport like rugby still be successful in Argentina where football is religion is through the, the, the strength of their club rugby scene, you know, not dissimilar to what club rugby in Australia was like, you know, back in the 80s and 90s as well and how it, how it sort of drove both the Sydney and Brisbane club rugby but drove the success of Australia back in those days. And it's a strong sense of community around rugby as a whole and I think that that drives players to want and then opportunities came with professionalism so more players grew, grew into the game. Yeah, I want to pick you up on, on what you say about soccer. It obviously plays second fiddle to soccer. Mm-hmm. Is there a sense of suspicion, like, or or is it, you know, we're Argentina here, we're we're, we're together. No, yeah, no, 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 Argentina. Yeah, together. There's, so there's, there's no, all oh, that's. Let's, no I guess way. over all here, the there's boys, a bit of a divide in rugby league, rugby union. No, all our players are fanatical soccer fans. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's an, and. But what about the soccer side of things? Looking no, at rugby the, union. No, the soccer's are, like even soccer, even the coach of the soccer team spoke about the rugby world cup they were in camp together and and about us and we've had some we had some connection with them about the experience they had in the world cup in 22 of football um and they were very supportive very supportive the players and the the coach there's a strong sense of nationalism in that country but genuine you know that genuine nationalism about you know we're argentinian this is we've got a Perform, this is a chance for us to show who we are on the world stage, you know, whether it's football or or, or in rugby or in any sport. You know, they're excellent in hockey and, and they're, they're a polo, you know, if you're into that game, you know, they dominate in that area. So, but there, there is very much, it's not a contest, you know, because all the rugby players are mad soccer supporters. So, you know, when Argentina's playing, um, everyone's, you know, and you get indoctrinated into that. I was the same, you know what I mean? Like when I went back just recently, Argentina were playing Brazil in the qualifiers, you know, it was in Brazil and we're, everyone's glued to the TV sets. It's a it's a cultural thing and it's part of, yeah, I, I've, I'm, me personally, if I look even here, I've always been split with the rugby league, rugby union. I don't see any clash whatsoever. I think the kids have grown up playing the two games and most of those Guys would have been brought up playing soccer. Yeah. You know, all of them from when they were young. And then they got to play rugby as well. And I think playing multiple sports is great for kids and and having that that good balance. You know? it, it it really is. And anybody that looks at um athlete development would see a, a, a multitude of sports is actually beneficial. Early specialization tends not to work. Well, I've been hammering my – I'd like my kids to play basketball, you yeah. know, because they get the, the ball skills, the coordination, you know, to 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 help them with the ball skills of rugby and just to, to see the different atmospheres and uh, diff, learn about different so – I love being going to see different sports, going into different – you're lucky as a coach you get to go and see different teams and, and hang out with different coaches and, and have a look at – I love the different atmospheres that are, you see in different sports. And I think that that – that's a strength of, well, for Australia, for example, that's a strength that we play so many sports here. You know, I mean, it can be difficult because there's a lot of competition, but it's a strength of ours having played so many, having so many sports. So I think Argentina, that that support across the board when it comes to their national teams, it's it's pretty, uh, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Well, I, I will ask you a little bit later on about how potentially rugby Australia could uh, emulate. What, what's happened in Argentina with the, with the growth uh, of the game and, and how Rugby Australia can gain some ascendancy and become a, a force once again. But before I go into that, um, coaching Argentina, now I know you're a very well-travelled man, but this would be the first team you've been a part of where Spanish is the uh, first language, I'm assuming? Yes, that's right. How did you find that? <laughs> so you, you're... Obviously, you said you've got your children in uh, French school here. Yeah. So bilingual yourself, you know, you spend a lot of time there. Well, yeah. I, I, um, well, I'm brought up, obviously, my parents are Lebanese, so I'm brought up with an ear for other languages. So my when I was younger, like a lot of ethnic kids, they would have spoken to you in Arabic and I would have answered in English, you know. So you've got the ear for it there. When I went to play rugby in France, I learned to speak French. And then I went and had a few years in Italy, so picked up a language there. And then, of course, like Spanish is a sort of next thing. So I just jumped on 
watch about 60 episodes of Narcos and uh, a few about 70 episodes of Pablo Escobar <laughs> story and and I was right to go and I said to the boys listen I'm going to speak Spanish to you as much as I can or Cartagena which is their version I'm going to make a heap of mistakes but we're going to use it together you're going to tell me what I'm making a mistake or you're going to understand and help me and I think it helped they really appreciate the fact that I had a, a go at it and, you know, I do press conferences in it and everything. And I think it was, it's important, especially for a national team, you know, before the game, before a national team game, I need to be speaking to them in their language, even if it's messy, you know. I mean, I think with my Italian and the rest of it, I, mean, I was able to, to make up the, the gaps and the, and the players understood. And, when, and I told a few of the guys, you know, if you, if you understand what I'm trying to say and I, I'm not getting it, you just come in and say it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Say so, Take the lead. Yeah, you don't. It's hard to imagine an interpreter giving a pre-game speech. Well, I've done it in Japan. I've had, I've had being in Japan. I've had to wear oh. interpreters do it. You know, and it. Well, you. What's that like? It's rolling the dice. You know, I wasn't coaching there. I was more doing directional stuff. But the coach, I could see. You know, having interpreters. Obviously, interpreter is very important. But it is, and you know, it's funny. You know, one of the games with with the Japanese team. I never really spoke when I was there at the times. I, I, there was a elimination game happening, and we were in we were in a bit of strife at half time, and I could see that the, the messages weren't going through. So in the before they went back out on the half time, I just got them together and just cracked on in English with the right tone. Didn't even give the interpreter the chance. Right, and they knew what I wanted to say. Well, well, well it's important how you communicate because it's not. It's not just the words that you use. No. It, it's, it's how you say it. The, yeah, your you body know, language, the body your tone. The, the, the you pause, know. the tone, yeah. the volume. It is. It's very important. And when you learn in, – and a lot of the languages that, you, you know, coaching in French or in Italian or in, in Spanish, the phrases aren't always the same. There's a lot of words that aren't even – don't exist in other languages that we think we're trying to translate. So making sure you get that the phrasing right and – and sometimes I would say I would just switch back into English because there was only just that one way to say it with the tone and they would they'll get it. You know, mm. they, they get it, they understand, they're footy players, they they worked it out and and it was a, almost an interesting way of bonding for the team, you know, where we got together because they had have a laugh sometimes and you got to, you know, you can't take yourself too seriously. But I really wanted to make a point of trying to speak you know, as much Spanish as possible. Well, well I, I think that's important. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of, you know, you know a, an Argentine player mm. and to see somebody come and make that effort, mm. like, shows that you care. Yeah. Well, I do care, you know, that's the thing. That's what... Uh, what he's about, you know, it's about caring for your players as a coach or, you know, whatever it might be. And I think that that's if you're fair income about that stuff, that's where you make the effort, you know. And don't be – I'm lucky because I've learned – I've had other languages, so I've learned that making mistakes is actually an advantage because then you learn how to make, say it properly the next time, you know. Yeah. Well, was there any ever – sorry, was there ever any sort of embarrassing moments where you, you've yeah, said something well, and then no, – you you're Maybe you're trying to say a serious point but you've said – Something completely out of context, and, and maybe seen a smile from a couple of the players. Well, the 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 one word that was <laughs> I know I'm not allowed to say it. So you can you say, say on this podcast, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I say the way it's the way you say things, right? So año is year, right? Y year, year as yeah, in so like we've had a great year or oh, this year. Yeah. Este año hacemos eso, right? But I was saying it ano without the the new which means your back's off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's been a great anus. Well, it's it's pretty great much, ass. yeah. Or as the Queen said, anus horribilis. Yeah, that was it, you know what I mean? Defend me. But a few, and then finally they had the courage to come and oh. tell me, you know what I mean? Like, mate, you need this. You can't, you can't write it like this. You can't say it like this. But there's so many little nuances. But, you know, I think even the media, sometimes it helped you a lot with the media because you could almost just, they could ask you a tough one and you just brush it off with, Saying the thing that you know you well, might, you, you didn't understand it or you got the the interpretation wrong or well, mate, that that that's it's all of a sudden I, I can't speak. <laughs> well, they get they cut you a little bit of extra slack there, and I think it's an interesting way to even handle it in your own. Like I've learned a lot from doing that, even about handling it in my own language, you know, my native tongue, about what's important to respond to and what's not, you know, and what's 
what are the important messages you want to give out and how to, you know, I've learned a lot about it. These, these last few years, since the 19 World Cup, have been so good for me personally, like spending time with Robbo, with the Roosters, that like it was great there. Then the rugby league stuff, the Argentinian, it's just given me another, I don't know, you're always learning, I suppose, and it can be cliched sometimes, but it really has. It's it's I've I've enjoyed it immensely and it's been challenging but it's been it's been really good for me personally I think it's given me another layer that I've that I've needed you know obviously with your um rugby league connections and and, and it's clear uh, the game of rugby league has influenced you and mm. and I believe in, in your coaching style as well was there, were there some new concepts that you uh, introduced to the Pumas, uh, and and if so, how did they take that? Oh, definitely. Well, I had David Kidwell with me, right? Yeah. So um, we took a lot of the indoor contact work that you know I would have seen around the dojo work inside with the with the rugby league teams, uh, and worked a lot of that. We worked a lot of it initially with the upper body tackling, locking up the ball keeping players up because you know that rule in rugby of holding players up instead of putting players on the ground you can you can create turnovers that yeah, way okay uh, so and then we changed again when rugby sort of went harder on the high tackling stuff we lowered our tackle base completely and used a whole different set of tools that Dave brought in as well because they've gone Below the stand well, or below? It's not, it, it, at the, in the club level games, yeah, it's below the, the, the tit, I think, or the, yeah. the shoulder line completely, the, the chest. In the international game, it's still, you know, below the, obviously below the shoulders. You can't make any contact with neck or head or anything. I think that they've handled it pretty well. And I think coaches are, like, I know for us, like we just changed our tackle. We didn't want to have any yellow cards or anything, so we just changed our tackle technique. So that's where you brought Kidwell in to lower the we changed the, the way the target yeah, zone. we changed the target zone and the levers that we'd use and how to slow the ball down. Because obviously, you, in both rucks, league and union, you're looking to slow the the ruck down with defensively, yeah. right? And we try to use the you know we amended a few different tactics. A lot of it I learned obviously with when I was with Roosters, Fit, Craig Fitz first with obviously there, and then Kingy. Um, working with Robbo. So that really showed me a lot about um, how I could manoeuvre those, adapt some of them. They weren't all like for like, but adapt some of those skills into the, the game um, of, uh, of rugby as well and how they could benefit us um, on the ground and in the air. What, what about attacking-wise? Yeah, I think that the, the, the idea of... Um, the depth of the carry is really important and the support player that comes outside. So in rugby now, there's a lot they, – they do look at the structure of the league attack, which is obviously much more structured because everyone's in yep. place, whereas rugby, it's more a moving feast, right? You League, you'll know who you're going to get to, whereas rugby, the defence is a bit more mobile, you know. You may not know who you're going to be able to run at, right? But what I'm talking about is when you're a lot of the block plays or players coming from other side of the field, that can be a lot more structured in league. So we take some of that structure uh, into rugby, but you can probably only bring a lot of that out in the first phases of plays mm -hmm. because that's where you know more where your players are going to be as opposed to in league you've got your players set in positions, mm. you know, more often than not. I think that... Um, Ball carry work. The, where where the, the big cro the interesting crossover for rugby and league is ball playing at the line. Yeah. Right. So we that's something that we want to do a lot of in union because we want to get the quick ball from the next ruck. Right. And in league, there's a real challenge around that as well because you want to do that because you'll get a one on one tackle, quick play the ball, or even a line break or an offload. But the more passes, the more risk of losing possession, you know, the, the way that the league looks in a high possession game. So there's a lot of, a lot of I think, work around that. And even in the passing skills, so obviously a lot of um, – we use a lot more six o'clock passing in, for short passing in league – in union through my experience in league because most union players are spin passing now, even short ball, right? So yeah. how you can – there's a bit more – You need more, to change – you. It, there is, you can't yeah. be 
spinning short balls. No, uh, rugby players aren't really taught about that type of passing with the higher elbow and all of that. Whereas league now, so the changes in the hand position, like the league, if you're going to throw a spin or a six o'clock, you can see the hands change. Mm. So it's about identifying, okay, how are we just going to have one hand position so you can't tell if you're going to throw one or the other and still make the ball either turn over and be a close short ball or be able to get pace and width on the pass at the same time. Yeah, how you disguise it. Yeah, how you disguise you can tell with that change of hand position. Yes, you can. It's interesting what you say, though, about um, like defences because I, I watch – some rugby union, not mm. a lot, but because the defence isn't as organised, it's not as structured. So I think back to my time in league, we'd have inside pressure, five man pressure, market pressure, mm. or we'd have an up and in jam style mm. defence, or, or a multitude yeah. of different defences. But but it's all organised, and when defences are organised, the last thing you want is anyone out of position. So I was a middle player. If I ended up, if one of our back rowers, for instance, got caught in a tackle, and I had to defend where the back rower should be, I'd be going, I, I, I'd be, <laughs> oh, I really hope he yeah. doesn't come here because I've got to now make a different decision. Yeah. So my point is this, that with rugby, with the with the less defensive structure, I think there's, an, a, there's a possibility to take advantage of having players out of positions in, in areas of the field that they don't feel comfortable. So I, I see it a lot where maybe um, some of the bigger forwards w- would end mm-hmm. up tied up on a short side yeah and i think you know or if you've got a three on two situation and you or, or even a three on three in in quite a handy bit of mm. space if you've got some less mobile players yeah, within that space sure. like it, if the players had the ability to you know an over skip overs play hands I but think you'll see New it. Zealand play like that a lot yeah. in rugby. But, mate, the, the, the one thing around that is there's the illusion of the 10 metres, right? So, ah. right now, the defense, this, this is an illusion because yes. the, 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 in league, obviously, the defense is 10 metres back. In mm. rugby, it's the attack that's back. Yes. Maybe not 10 metres, but it's back. So, you have this imaginary gain line, which everyone wants to get over, right? Now, in league, Everything's moving, the defence, everything's moving at you before you can really come and get off the line. It's all coming at you. Mm. Whereas in rugby, it's the reverse. The, the D's coming at you. You've got to make your moves at the D coming at you. And it's because you want it. We're, we're concentrating on this idea of we've got to keep going forward, right? Get over the advantage line, go forward. That the, the dynamic sort of changes around how you want to play the game. So if I play the ball, I get a flat uh, in league, you get a flat pass. And Jad Rui Hargrave's running at me. He's got a man on the outside. It's a push a player out the back. And I've got to try to come forward, still take yards out of that. Well, my natural tendency is I better sit down here, yeah. make this tackle and cover one, two, three players as opposed to go up. And Whereas in union, you can sort of take a little bit less of that sit down approach. You can go up and try and get him a little bit more because if you get him behind the advantage line, you're in stride. Yeah, I- I guess it would be a bit more risk reward, mm-hmm. um, but I still feel that, that there's the ability to take take advantage of that. No doubt about it. If you want to try, like that's why the inside pressure concepts that are strong in league, that they, they are much harder to transfer into rugby because you uh, there'll be it's mainly middle players who'll be coming out with that inside yeah. pressure. Whereas in rugby, anyone could end up in that section. So mm. you've got to have everyone well-versed in how to drive inside pressure, you know, and that takes a long time to get, whereas you can take the middles and really focus on them for inside pressure for, you know, it, it's, it's, I love the, the laying the two over each other because you get to, you can, if you really think about it, you can get some great ideas. I know that when I speak to the boys at Brewsters, they've always had good ideas of, from rugby and for rugby and taking ideas away as well. You know, I'm sure that um, there's so much, uh, crossover you can have and you can see some of the coaches who have done well like Sean Edwards you know yeah Andy Farrell's coming Andy over Farrell's here Andy done a great job um, you know Dave's come in and, and done that a lot there, I think there's a number of well Les Kiss is, who's you know league guys come on coaching now the Reds there's um, and um, uh, there's so much I think if they're guided well by a rugby coach who understands also the league side of things they can really help them to integrate and use the skills that they got from league well in rugby and vice versa. I think there, there, there'd be some good rugby coaches that can transfer their knowledge 
um, of a different attacking shapes and different things from counter-attack, et cetera, that can be, be brought into league as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, j- just back to the to the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you, the head coach of, of the Pumas and the, the Argentine, Argentine national team, what did you feel when Australia went out in the group stage? Well, yeah, obviously, look... It's a team that's close to me, you know, obviously being Australian, number one, and having coached a team as well. And coached a team to World Cup final once and to uh, quarter final. It was, yeah, well, like I won't say it was hard because that I was, I had my head immersed in another, in another team and that was my total mm. focus. But I saw my kids who obviously mad Argentina supporters, but also <clears throat> when they're not playing Argentina, they're supporting Australia. So... The, that was hard. It was hard for me to see players like, you know, say Michael Hooper and not, not be here and not be there for it, players of high quality who have got experience. So, you know, I felt for the fans too, you know. A lot of fans who I, spoke, I saw at the tournament, you know, um, Aussie fans and got to, to see a few. But, like, that's how it goes sometimes, you know. It's about how you react now. Yeah. Well, how they react now um, sort of leads me into my next question. Was it... Was there ever interest in, in, in yourself taking up the, the no, job as well? No, look, as maybe it was, I don't know, no one ever contacted me from Australia the, about it. I think they had Joe locked away, uh, Joe Schmidt locked away pretty early in the piece. They had an idea of what they wanted. Um, and, I, I, you know, I think that's that's only logical that they would do that. But, no, I never had any discussion about them. I, I was, like when the talk for me started stay, to stay with Argentina, obviously that's what... I would have liked to do if it was you know, a perfect world because I was have a very good connection with them there, um, but uh, no, that, that never. Really, it's all pretty new and fresh for me as well. So uh, like just finishing up there, but uh, no, that never happened. And I think they've got a plan now that they see with with Joe um, coming in. It'll be interesting to see who he brings in in his team with him. I still think though, mate, that. Here, the, the big fix is in Super Rugby. It's not at the national level. I, you know, I'd be, if I was them, I'd be investing everything in trying to get the best coaches to get Super Rugby going because there's no coincidence that when our our teams go well in Super Rugby, Australian teams, our national team performs well as well, especially at World Cups. That That's traceable, right? So I'd be trying to throw my, my, my way I'd play it would be throw as many eggs uh, as many eggs as I can into the super rugby basket get those teams performing at a high level competing with the Kiwis more regularly you know winning games so that then the national coach picks up a team that's got confidence that's got some skills that have been delivered for them in the build up throughout pre-season they're fit they're ready to go if you were in charge um where's your focus point pathways or um Rating existed talent, i.e. rugby league, the NRL. No, I'd be pathways for pathways. sure. Yeah, yeah, like I think the pathways of <clears throat> uh, leading leading pathways into a transition um, competition have a, have a good transition competition for younger players that then leads them into Super Rugby when they and build that way, and then the year end product will be a good national team regardless because there's good quality players out there. Um, and yes, where there's a competition with league and but I think you're seeing now more and more players are going and coming and going and coming, and and there's enough. I do believe that that the quality of coaching when those players then come out of the school system, the pathway system, into a competition that <clears throat> is a, a strong competition that's going to give them the, the professional, um, like give them a taste of professionalism that's going to be seen by the public, you know, that's going to get them ready for then Super Rugby and then Super Rugby prepare players for international rugby. That's how I've always seen it. You know, I think players will make changes. Players are always interested in looking at different games and playing a game you would have seen even like through Sam Burgess who changed and went back and that interest will be always there and then it'll be just about opportunities when they come as opposed to, oh, I'm going to go and get that guy or I'm going to go and get – I don't think that works. I, I guess though as a – you know, put yourself in the shoes as a an athletic 15-year-old, um, you know, you've you've got the, the AFL is, a, is an option if you've got those certain attributes, um, you've got – league you've got union how can rugby union attract that that top 
level talent. Hey, you just got to sell yourself, mate. Like it's, it's about what. Well, I don't think you. I, I've all, I've spoken to many players over my time, either with the Waratahs when I was there, who were either considering league or union. And one thing I would never do is talk the other game down, right? Yeah. The other game's a great game. You're good at it. This is what this game's going to give you. This is what you can do. I don't want to, you know, this is what we can do for you. This is how we'll help you prepare to be a better player and have a longer career. The, the things that go with what you want to have when you go to a club. If you're a player and you were going to a club, I would think about the things that I'd want to see when I went in there and what I'd want to have said to me, you know, what I, what I want to see. And then you also, it's about how you treat players that are in your system already because a lot of players are looking at that. You know, how are older players getting treated? How are they, what's happening? Are they going back into the game afterwards? Who's doing coaching? Because you see that. You see what the care, <clears throat> the care factor is. I think when players and obviously their families see that there's a care factor and you believe in your, your game and your product and you really truly believe it. it's not a fake sell, it's you truly believe that these are the things that you can get from it and that we can help you do and you can enjoy the game in this way because that's what it's there for. Well, you just – it's it, I find I think it's easy. I think you just tell the truth of what you got. Now, you've got to create those things to be able to sell them. You can't sell yeah. fake stuff, right? Well, is, is money the answer with something like private it's equity? Part, I don't know about the private equity deals. Like the, I don't know enough about because the it's detail. Because re- it's like – I'll be upfront and honest. As a kid, the the the, the Wallabies was was an iconic global brand, mm-hmm. and it it doesn't seem to carry the same weight. But that said, doesn't mean that it can't in the future. So no, I think it's well, the Wallabies are a construct of all the things that lead up to it. We talked earlier about Argentina and the club scene. So I believe even looking after the club scene better, valuing that that better because. That's not only just possible players, that's supporters, mm. people who are buying merchandise, coming to test matches, you know, that, that whole volunteer network that goes with that and valuing every part of that puzzle all the way up. And you see in the good clubs that that's what they're doing, you know, and, 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 whether, and then eventually you just keep building into your system and the, the top part, which in this instance is Australia, the what national team, It'll just profit from from the work that you're doing in there. And I think that you build real things, you have a real philosophy about what you want to see in your game, you have a real – you build credibility in that way and then you just go and sell it and you'll win some of those battles and you'll lose some. And then you you, you just keep doing that, that really good work and eventually it pays off. Uh, I'm going to ask you at the end about what you think may, may be next. Um but would a role within Rugby Australia to help develop the framework appeal to you? And, and have you had any of those conversations? Because I think, again, with speaking to you now, obviously you're very passionate about um, Australian rugby, you, wealth of experience. Plus, you've been in, you've been the coach of the national team. But also, I think your experience with Argentina mm. and and everything that you've been through with that nation and and even before that, seeing what's worked, what hasn't, would be massively beneficial. Yeah, mate, I still love coaching, you know. I want to coach in the... You don't want to... I want to coach in the, like, ideally the League World Cup in 26, you know, and the Union World Cup in 27 here. I know, you know, that... I'm not in with a team at the moment, but those events are like they're they're unbelievable. Like, and while I can, why would I want to? I don't want a career out of footy. I love being involved in the games, and you know, it's not a career thing from like in that way. And I think those things can happen later, maybe. Well, I'm not sure when, but at the moment, I love. I feel like I'm learning about more being better at coaching all the time, you know, and improving myself in that area. Um, and I do, I really, I really like it. So I haven't even thought about that. Like I said, I always say to my kids, you know, one day I'm going to grow up, I'll have to grow up and get a real job. Like I'm not sure what it'll be because coaching footy is not a job, James. It's like being part of the team, you know, and, and you're lucky you get to do it professionally, but it's not a, it's not a job. Well, you said you like it. I think you love it, like yeah. it, 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 it clear. It, it makes you tick. Like it makes you feel alive. You, 
you've got a real love and joy. Yeah, for it's, your, it's your life too. Like your family live it, the results, you know, the ups and downs and how how good, you know, like the the to be involved in a game that, you know, yeah, it doesn't always go great but it's part of life and, you know, we were talking before, I think you become very good at turning negatives into positives, you know, as a, as a coach and you learn so many things and you meet so many great people, you know, like, uh, and, uh, players, I mean, in particular, because guys are doing things for you that you wouldn't believe. You know, I appreciate so much the players who, you know, make the, the effort to follow the things you do because sometimes it's not easy what you ask them to do, you know. And I know they get paid and all that stuff, but still to do it with that extra little bit that, like, I want to be the best, that's something special. I love I really, you know, enjoy doing it and you can see, I don't know, it's, podcast you can't see anything I don't think but it puts a smile it, it does it makes you smile see. makes you enjoy because it's what you, it's, you love and I've been able to travel the world live in different places learn other languages meet it's been unbelievable uh, I'd like to ask about your sort of coaching philosophy um when you go into a job what what's your main area of focus well look it depends on what's the the, the team requires and what what you're brought in to do no cookie cutter approach it's our observation first. Well, I believe that you go to a club or a nation national team, and they tell you what they want. Right? This is what we want our team to look like. This is what we want because it's not my team, right? So, this is this is what we want. These are the things I want to be seen. We want it to be known for. This is what we want to do. And then I'll say, okay, well, this is how I plan to do it. And then after that, like, leave me alone, and I'll do it because I know what your objectives are. Right, so I want to get you to that. Uh, uh, that clarity is super important. You so have those conversations as before you, for sure, before you sign the contract. It's like, tell me what you want. Here's I'm going to deliver it. Leave me the fuck alone. Well, I, I don't think it's about. It's about making that understanding that you can do what you like, that that you can do what they want. Because, mate, I believe that the picking coaches is like three dimensional. You know, it's the right person for the right team at the right time. Uh, there's not, you know, what might be good for the Bulldogs in 2007 may not be good for the Bulldogs in 2012 because they're in a different cycle. They've mm. got a different thing going on. And, you know, I've always been with turnarounds majority of my time my life. You know, it's always been teams that have struggled and they need a turnaround and a kick to, to go forward. So once you get a hand on exactly what the club wants or what the team wants or the, the, the organisation, if it's a, it's a national team, which we, we did with Argentina, you know, it's really easy to then make a plan, give that plan back to them mm. so they can have confidence that, okay, this coach knows what we want to do. And then if you start deviating off that plan, then they can come and say, oi, like what's going on here, you know. But that confidence in between ch uh, chairman CEO, coach, captain, that strong link is the key to success inside of the organisations because that trust and that belief in those people all, all linked together is so fundamental to the rest of the organisation. No one can get around you. You know, you could still have the hard discussions inside of there and things change, you know, like scenarios change, you know, you lose players or things happen, whatever, but that type of um, um, backbone inside of an organisation or inside of a federation will decide how how successful that you are. You know, you could still be successful without it, but how successful. Sometimes you'll get a odd win here or there, mm. but consistent success is about consistent performance in all areas of the business, whether it's on the field or off the field. And I think that that's really, really important. And then from there you make the analysis of what you need to do in the short term, in the medium term and the long term so you can start making the changes that are necessary if changes are necessary. And it's it's something that you sort of like you get to – now I've been doing it amazingly and you know, I think I started in 99 first coaching. So what's that now, 24, 25 years, you get a feel for it pretty much straight away, you know. And uh, it, was, it was really interesting for me that little period there when the League World Cup was on because there was a union tour on as well. So I was sort of going between the two. I brought them up to Manchester, the Argentinians, for a three-day camp while the World Cup was on. We had dinner to get – because it was two very different requirements for two different teams and I was having a flick between the two. 
And but if you're really clear with what <clears throat> me as the head coach, what my role is, and you you've got a good crew of guys with you, and then you, you you should be able to have that clarity and have it linked in with your superiors that are at the organisation, so that everyone's on cue with exactly what we're doing. Is that the art of coaching then? Just clear roles, alignment. Yeah, <clears throat> alignment. Yeah, yeah, alignment. You're clear with what I want from you, and look, no one's ever. There'll always be a confusion of a conversation here or there, but <clears throat> when there's the clarity in conversation, you can then get eliminate that, you know, as quickly as possible. But that alignment to a vision, creating a vision, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, and and then aligning everyone to that vision and how you align, that's really the key. Then the rest of it, the details of, you know, how you do it, how you get to certain levels, whether they be more tangible things around football or fitness or whatever and how you – evolve <clears throat> culturally, leadership, tactically, They're, that's all part of it. But I think having a vision and aligning everyone because I can put this bottle down here and you can say it's green and I can say it's blue, right? And that's – you've got to get everyone starting to see the same thing. Hmm. Hey, are you the type of coach that can switch off or dial it down, like away from well, <clears throat> your <throat> a- coaching hour, so to speak? Are you Are you good at – yeah. Compartmentalizing. <clears throat> yeah, very good. At it. Like I can have a full blue with you and then two minutes later we'll be okay. You know oh, but, what I mean? Uh, but I mean in, in terms of like yeah, taking away from the game. Getting, getting yeah, away. Yeah. 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 Well, I've always had my it's business a good interests. Skill. It's a good skill to have <clears throat> that where you can yeah. go hard, blue, and then it's forgotten about. But you can yeah. you can just – is it a switch off, a dial down or – I think it's just about understanding the – what's needed at any given time, what you need as well, you know what I mean? There's sometimes where <clears throat> the unpredictability of, of, of your in, your interactions with players, like when I see players sometimes away from that footy environment, I don't want to talk to them about footy. I want to talk yeah. to them about – like I rang a guy today who played in the World Cup with Lebanon who I haven't spoken to since the tournament, just rang him out of the blue, I don't know. I think he was shocked. He didn't know it was me, like, because he didn't have my number. I didn't think he was a bit shocked. I called, but I just wanted to say, "Oh, how you going, mate? Like, what's what's going on?" You know, I didn't talk to him about footy at all or or anything, because I think that you've got to you've got to also in the head coaching role, you've got to also you know have curate a different type of relationship with people because it can't just all be business. You know, you look, you're asking them to exceed their potential. Right? And to make them to believe that they can exceed their potential, you've got to have a different type of relationship with them than just saying, I'll do this or do that or, you know, do the other. And I think that's it's important. And also from, from my own point of view, I like to have a different, you know, I think from my own business life, I suppose I had a very different business. I was playing rugby and working for a, a high-end fashion designer, you know. It was a cop a fair bit of stick on the field, definitely. Um, but it was great because it was totally different you know, different life away from the game, you did, know. And did like that, that help you though? Yeah, you I think you so, feel yeah. it, Without it. Well, you can mix and match it with a whole lot of different mm-hmm. people. Um, and it helped me. Well, it helped me definitely because I think that all players and coaches or whatever should have growing different interests because of the nature of what, what we do. Sometimes you can be in and sometimes you can be out. And you can't be defined by who you are and – you know, in that environment, you've got to be defined by who you are as a person. And, you know, you that <clears throat> for me, I like that ability to wheel and deal and mix and match and a few businesses here and, you know, be able to go into a, you know, I always like the idea of you've got to be able to drink champagne with the king and a VB on the building side with the boys, you know what I mean? And just be comfortable in, in all environments. And I think that being, having different interests helps you do that. Mm, I, I have a, Different saying, not too dissimilar, but I could have a beer with the Pope or a prostitute. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll pass on that one for the moment. <laughs> um, mate, we, we can't skip over this. We've got a, we still got a bit I'd like to ask you about, yeah. but fashion business, right? That's a bit <laughs> vague. Uh, I want to know more. Okay. So, so yeah, look, over to you. <clears throat> I, I left school 
I didn't like I sort of I think I registered to go to teachers college but I just never showed up because I'd been to school for however long it was and I couldn't bring myself to go to university again so I really didn't um, have anything going on I started working down at my local at the club where I played rugby at Ramwick and I got a one day there was like a letter on the or a torn the, the boss had an absolutely messy desk and he there's a torn up little thing saying looking for a player in France you know I just took the number you know off and I rang the guy ended up playing over there and like we talked about before I got the languages and I think I did six years of six or seven years non-stop playing like over there over here over there over here and then eventually I wanted to come home I need to get a job like I didn't have any well was, rugby was just going pro but I you know I was I wanted to get a job and I looked into job ads I went, we just were used to look in the newspaper for the job ads. And there's a fashion designer called Colette Dinigan who was Australia. She would have been number one designer in Australia at the time. And she was looking for someone who spoke French, a business manager, spoke French and Italian, and which I could from playing rugby. And I just sort of made the rest up really on my CV. You know, my sister, my cousins had a couple of shops in Pado and I sort of just did the rest out and I had a couple of interviews and got the job. So are you, so, are um, you just... Sorry. They're right. And um, I, got, you- I got the job. So from there, I just learnt on the run, you know. And So, and so what do you do? What, like, are you, you trying, <laughs> trying them on? No, no. So <laughs> I was like responsible for, well, business management, running the, like the finance, the, the staff. Uh, the logistics, there was a big, there's a pretty big logistics operation around moving the, the pieces around for production. Um, and, you know, then the government grants, all that type of stuff that, that, that went with it. So I learned about all that over maybe three, four years. While I was there, I ran into an old school friend of mine who was working for a different fashion company. And we talked about, we had a few get togethers and we said, well, let's start something of our own. And we went on a trip. We sort of coordinated <clears throat> the trip where we had to go to the US. <clears throat> and we looked at a few different brands thinking about distribution. So getting the rights to buy a product and then redistribute it in another uh, country. So yeah, if a, if a brand is well established That's in, right. well, in, we, in the States. And we were lucky, we hit a, we got a one, in the early 2000s when the whole denim thing was just starting to kick off, you could buy denim for exorbitant prices. We found this brand. I was lucky. I went out, night out on the drink with the designer and he said, here, yeah, take the samples. We went back to Australia and, and we started selling it. Pretty much out of the back of my sister's shop where she had a shop, a fashion shop, we started working out of the back of the shop and started building up the business. And I had a heap of the um, Ramwick boys. I started coaching then. I'd come back from Italy, coach at Ramwick then, and I had a fair few of the Ramp boys working for me in the business. So we pretty much hubbed uh, the footy business, the same place mm-hmm. where the fashion business was. We had an old church down in Surrey Hills. So we were running like a footy team and a fashion business out of there. And one of them is still working for the business like 20-something years later now, 20 years later now. And... Um, and then it just grew and grew and grew. And now, like, our HQ is overseas. It's in London. Like, we're in Shoreditch in East London. Um, there with a, we've got a, you know, it's just built into a business that was built on sort of credibility of having good brands early on. And we were able to open up a range of good stores. So we sold to and it grew and grew and grew. We ended up taking it to Europe, like I said, and things went from there, you know. And it was, it was, it was great for me because then when coaching got more serious, obviously I pulled out of, the day-to-day runnings of that business, but I still like they're we're over there now. They're Fashion Week in Paris this week, so the you know the teams over there doing the selling now, and you know I get all the benefits of going to the dinners and you know all, all the bits and pieces there. But it was fans like what Colette would do. Um, they they went Paris runway shows. Yeah, you know, they were the only Aussies that were showing there really at the time, and it was unreal. I was going to the fashion show. Do you feel like you fit in it? Like Paris but I fashion love week. the whole dysfunctional fact that I was a footy player. <laughs> oh, so you're going to say dysfunctional fashion No, industry. no, no. The whole thing that was crazy about being there and then going back and playing. And I think they liked it too, you know. She liked the fact that I didn't know. I wasn't ensconced in the whole fashion mm. scene. I was more footy, but I enjoyed doing the that work, you know, which was keeping everything sort of on the level, 
making sure things were running how they how she needed them to. She was a phenomenal operator around how she did design and then production, like special around that. So that's why she was one of the leaders in Australian fashion at the time. So it worked out great for me, you know, and I and it gave me another window on life, you know. Mm. So it wasn't all just about footy, even though I loved Love playing and then coaching afterwards. I, I, I am kind of just dis- disappointed. I was really hoping you were going to say like how I was designing outfits and <laughs> deciding what's on trend for the for the Australian no summer of. Well, no what, one, no one that knows me is actually going to believe that. You've seen how I turn up dressed well, today in a pair of shorts. Hey, and a maybe so. you, make, you make a statement. <laughs> no, no. Look, I, you, you you like to um, ham it up sometimes and have a joke, but that. That it was so. It's very interesting and it's competitive. Like it's super competitive. But um, it was it was so good for me to have a totally different outlook on things, especially when I was playing. You know, it was because uh, that professional era came in. You know, I got invited to go to the Institute of Sport. I played Australian Twenty Ones. The the you come to the Institute of Sport, be a professional rugby player, and I went down there and hopped up and down on one leg a couple of times. Said no, I'm going back to. <laughs> to have a proper life, you know what I mean? And, and I loved footy and that's probably why I never got to play national team. You know, I probably didn't commit like I needed to. That's probably a, a regret that you have, you know, never getting to play for the national team. But um, I've had the honour of coaching it, which has been mm. fantastic. But having that other life that's gone with that, the business life has helped me immeasurably in, yeah. in what I've been able to do in footy. Yeah, you, you, you can tell that it, it, it really benefits and... I think even speaking to any great coaches, they've always got something else to get going on in their life that helps them decompress in a way or look at things or have different problems to focus on. And yeah. And there's the financial side too, mate. No compromises. You're not, you're not coaching for money. You're coaching because you love it. And then you, you know, you don't compromise. Oh, do I have to, am I going to get the bullet here? Like, should I not do this thing that I really think I should do? Will that put me at risk? Those things never get in your head. That's it's a huge position to be in. Right? Uh, yeah, think, Even yeah. think about your recent transition out of Argentina. You don't have that financial burden of, or that what am I going to do next burden. Well, you ha- it gets in, it helps you know, it helps you know that you, you're capable of doing other things as well, you know. Yeah. So, like, like I've obviously I've made it, I have tried not to, but in the times where I have made compromises, you know, probably I can identify one or two times in, in big situations where I have, where I probably shouldn't have, and they've you've turned out with a bad result. So well, I really believe in that philosophy that you, you know, you've got to keep your life, driving your life and your coach for the, for the, the enjoyment and the passion and the, the ups and downs of it. And, it's tough. I'm not saying you can't do it, but obviously, but it's tough if you're doing it to pay your mortgage, you know. We're just going to take a quick break to talk about friends of the show, AG1. Now, taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last two years, I've been drinking AG1 every single day. No exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel energized, focused, and it really takes away that mid-afternoon slump that I used to suffer from. It was awful, but now thanks to AG1, it doesn't happen. It delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's powerful, healthy habits that's also powerfully simple. Healthy aging shouldn't feel complicated. The thought of taking multiple supplements, pills, protein powders, etc., sounds exhausting. But just one daily scoop of AG1 covers my nutrient gaps and supports my mental and physical health without any hassle in just 60 seconds every morning i know i'm giving my body what it needs and setting up sustainable habits in the long run we are so grateful to have ag1 as a partner of the show and if there's one product that i had to recommend to elevate your health it's ag1 that's why we've partnered with them for so long so if you want to take ownership of your health start with ag1 try ag1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin d3 and k2 and five free ag1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com forward slash buy round that's drinkag1.com forward slash buy round check it out 
We spoke a little bit about your, your time at Rugby Australia. Um, and I think the, the probably the pinnacle of that was the, the 2015 World Cup. That was the last time just the, the Wallabies, the brand was up in the big lights. What, what are your memories from that tournament? Yeah, it was great. Like, well, obviously we're in a tricky pool. Well, we what I, what I do remember is we had an unbelievably good build-up. Like, uh, the players were outstanding. We did some crazy things in the lead-up too, mind you, like to get them shake the tree a little bit. But you brought, we, brought in the the um, the the ghetto law, right? Well, I felt like we needed a bit more experience. You know, it was spe- specifically around like uh, uh, Matt Drew Mitchell as well, who was playing mm-hmm. overseas. You know, I think we just needed one or two players extra to be able to to help us with what we needed, you know. And I think we had a good – we had a really good balance of players who were committed. That that commitment level was very high. But were you the main instigator in, in, in driving that? And how, how do you approach that conversation with the – I guess, well, those laws are in place for a reason. Yeah, I think the laws are good. And then, the other ones were good, you know, at the time because, yeah, you know – But you, you felt like there was a need for change – well, I thought it through, tried to think it through logically. So, well, I didn't feel like we needed an overall change. I felt like I needed those players. Yeah, so, it was as okay, simple as that. How, how could I get those? But let's think about a way to do it logically. So what I thought was <clears throat> if you've played 60 games, which we set the cap was, then that means you've probably given, uh, based on the fact that you're probably playing average eight or nine tests, six, seven years of at least service to the national team. And at that stage, you know, that, and not to mention you've probably played another four or five years of provincial rugby before you've got those test starts, you know. So uh, I th- we, we sort of validated through the fact saying, okay, we've made a significant commitment to the, the, nas- to the rugby in the country. You, <clears throat> we can have those players then if there's any of them over there that qualified and we thought were good enough to play and we thought there was two or three that were good enough to play and it worked out quite well. I think it was a quite logical theory which I was then able to go and sell to the board members. I was able to sell to the chair, CEO, the chair and the board members. If they didn't think it was a, a, a good sell then they wouldn't have adopted the thing. I couldn't do it like autonomously make that decision. So I had to go and sell on sell to the to the board members, and I think they thought quite rationally about that at the time. And good decisions were made, I think. So, uh, you know, I, I think it, that having a guy like Matt in particular really helped us because he he um, he had that. Uh, I suppose his Andrew as well. But the kids had that bit of that aura from the two thousand and three World Cup. Probably a young guy coming in and. Um, had played and had a good, you know, he's obviously a serious player as well. And his, their, their level of commitment to the team when they come back, the way they train, the way they play, not to mention the fact that their, their team over there did not pay them for the time that they were gone. The rules weren't in place there. So they made a sacrifice financially, big sacrifice financially to come back and play, the both of them. And uh, and I think it, 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 it helped galvanise the team. team had a great build-up and then we were in a tough group. Yeah, very tough. Very tough group, you know, obviously with England at, at home and and we played with real freedom, you know. We had God confidence and real freedom. That was where we, we opened the team up, like, to feel really free, even to the point where, you know, we said when we, we put ourselves out there on social and all that type of stuff, you know, it's all going to be about laughing, you know, either laughing or bleeding. You know, one or the ah. other from training. You know, not not feeling stressed, not looking like that's who we want to be. We want to. We know we're up in a tough group, but we're going to be playing with no fear. And uh, and I think that we had great players like uh, you know David Pocock, Hooper, uh, Wycliffe Palu. You know, he got injured early, but he made a, he had a huge influence on that team. Um, there was a lot of great players there that that made the extra efforts to to make sure that commitment was at 100%. Because it's easy sometimes for commitment to be at 90% and it still look really good, right? But commitment of the best players in your nation at 100% looks like something very different. And when they're fully committed, it makes a huge difference. And that's, I think, how we're able to get through that pool um, as winners. And then it was quite weird because we had Twickenham almost as our base because it was meant for England. They thought they'd win that group. And uh, we weren't able to get over the last hurdle in the end, but 
It was it was a great memory because we did a lot of crazy things on the way in. So it was good. And I think it was off the back of success in Super Rugby. Waratahs had won in 2014. Um, Brumbies were strong also in that period and Reds weren't too far behind. So we had good provincial teams going and that was always helpful to the to, to the national team's cause. And the first, in fact, in 2015, I coached Waratahs and Australia. Oh. Yeah. So it was it was it was weird because I'd taken over in 14. I was still coaching the Tars. And uh so it was, we'd have great conversation team meetings because I'd give, say, uh, I remember the, a player from Queensland would get a, I'd give you a rap, you know, this is great, you're on the video. I said, but don't think I'm going to take it easy on you when you're playing. Yeah. I'm going to bash you up <laughs> proper next year. So you could have a bit of that banter yeah. that that gave you uh, an insight in with players and we had a, we had a good crew of guys there, yeah. I'm just picking up on a, a few of the things you said that we're only going to show ourselves laughing and bleeding. Mm. You can't do that with every team. Was that the right fit? Yeah, like right the, fit is that, for that right time. fit, right time, right fit, right, right time, place. short term. Yeah, you know, was it because the the team had sort of there was a late change in the coaching. There wasn't a lot. There wasn't. We weren't very fancy going into that tournament. You mm. know, you and Mackenzie had been the coach, and it was a change late in the piece. I picked up, uh, so we weren't real fancy. And I think we wanted to give off a, a, a that look to the. the to sort of strain supporters that, you know, we're, we're here to have a red hot go and we're not really worried about the consequences. Yeah. You know, and I, I felt that that played well. And you can't, it's true, you've got to have campaigns, you know, you've got to develop campaigns and themes that go into your preparation all the time. Almost and, like a mission thing. Yeah, like, and they're different missions, yeah. to keep guys going. And different, different circumstances need. I've used many different ones over mm. the years, you know, with teams. And that suited us down to the ground, you know what I mean, for that crew of guys and... It was it was tough because there was some good. There, we had a good. I think we had a good group of players as well who were performing well at their provincial teams, and and that helped as well. You know, so um, that next level of commitment was there, and, and it got us uh, got us to the final. We weren't able to win, but uh, it was that being able to be at the World Cup for the distance, like go these there for the seven weeks, which we've been able to have do twice now. It's a different experience, definitely, to going out in the quarter, which happened once, you know, where you have to leave and that's it, it's all over. Can you talk to us as well about, you say you did some crazy things in preparation? <laughs> what? Uh, like <laughs> stuff, one day we, we haven't, we're having a camp, it was a bigger group, it was not the, the squad, and I got a, I sent a message out to everyone, I had these guys, I can't sort of say who they were, they... Well, I can't say they kidnapped the players individually, <laughs> but they we, they were told to go to they an address <laughs> in, an, in, in an industrial area in Brisbane, and I think we were in Brisbane, and knock on a door where they were taken inside and interviewed. I don't know if the – hopefully the gun wasn't loaded, maybe at <laughs> gunpoint, I'm not sure. But, uh, it was it was hilarious. I, I – I've actually still – I'm planning one day to send all the – I've never watched them, but they're, they're, they're all videoed with a close-up or uh, those GoPro things. But I want to send them to the – I've been meaning to send them back to the players like so they can watch them back because I don't think they ever – like the guy was sat behind them. They were sat there. There was a person in front of them. They asked them all these crazy questions. And I think it was – it was it had nothing to do with anything, right, James, except for you. they were told you are not to talk about this to anyone. Right, what's mm. happened here today, and just about having the shared experience, you know. And eventually, I brought the guy who asked the questions into the team environment, and they go, "Weren't you the guy? Is that not the voice that we heard?" And then they were able to share a bit of the experience together. So it was nothing. It was nothing to do with footy. Yeah. It was more about saying, "Oh, they could get in the room together and say, what about?" Like they knew they couldn't talk to each other, but they'd all knew that it had happened. So it was just. I think sometimes you got to do those crazy things to build a bit of team, especially once, you know, uh, maybe things haven't been going great. You want to turn things around. You want to get guys connected in. And sometimes those shared experiences, which are, can be all types of different things, are a great way to connect players together, stuff that's outside of footy and not really got anything to do with them. A hundred percent it is, thinking outside the box. And I can think myself of, of a few 
not too dissimilar incidences, mm. not being interviewed at gunpoint, but there's a few funny <laughs> things we've done along the way. But it does, it builds that um, shared experience and uh, and especially going into a, a campaign like that, yeah. tough group, something different to set you apart. In that group, you face the host nations, England. Mm. Um, how did it feel to to beat us? <laughs> For a home semi-final. Oh, sorry, oh. for a ho- in, in in a home World Cup, yeah. rather. Well, I like it was nice. Yeah, it was good. I more for us than for them for what happened in England. I I wasn't really too fussed. We 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 know we we had to. I think I'm not sure if we with if that was the knockout blow for them. It could have been. That could be the one that knocked him out, but. Just for us, for the fans, you know, there it was it was it was awesome, you know, like as in as far as experiences are concerned, because there was so much hype, you know, in that game, and the elect- Twickenham is a great stadium, like, and the electricity in the game and the lead up, I don't know how they work it out. The lights were off, the lights were on, the build up, it was crazy, you know. The there was so much expectation. It's rare that that you know for that game and. When it went well for us, uh, it really – you could feel the pressure, you know. When England cut back into it a little bit towards the end, it was like – it was a great experience to be out from a footy – as a fan for a footy game because it was like – you know when they say you can cut the atmosphere with a knife, that was a night you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. The tension was was huge and, like, it was great for us. And I know it was hard – it was hard for them but, but – uh, you know, that's that's what you're there to do, you know. You're there to, to spoil the party for those, especially for us because we weren't fancied. So spoiling the party for the, the home team was, was perfect for us. Mm. Well, a little bit of a league caveat in that um, Sam Burge is, is playing uh, for the English national team mm-hmm. against against you, uh, against um, the, the Wallabies. But I believe he had a couple of conversations with yourself about... Um, coming over and, yeah. and what to expect uh, yeah, yeah. in the world of rugby union. Yeah, we watched a bit of footy together and, uh, you know, I think I, I actually truly believe that Sam could have stayed in that game and been a great player, but I think they, they stuffed him around a fair bit. His club played him in one position and the national team played him in another. So the guy's trying to come over and convert from a game he hasn't played before, which I feel he could have. And it was, it was funny, you know, he came and after the game he was sat in the dressing room with us for a bit because obviously I knew him and he knew a few of the players and he come in at, you know, post-match. And in that moment it sort of struck me, I thought to myself, he, he actually could have played for us, like for Australia. He would have qualified. He'd been in Australia long enough. If he was going to play rugby, he could have come yeah. play rugby for Australia, not for not for England, you know what I mean? And well, I never thought about it, obviously, until sort of that moment. But I feel yeah, like he, he could have qualified. Yeah, he? he would have qualified from his residential status from, from the rugby rules. So... Um, well, you look at you know Brad Thorne. He played yeah. league for New Zealand and rugby for he played league for Australia and rugby for New yeah. Zealand. You know, so and and I feel like if Sam had a bit more of a, a pr- well prepared transition program, he would have done well. If you look, you know, look at Ben Teo who made that transition did it very well. You know, I think he would have been a lot more successful because he's a great player and he's got a great footballer's mentality. So it didn't matter which game he was playing, he would have been successful. Yeah. In it. And he's one competitive little That's bugger it. as well. Exactly, I can yeah. vouch for that. No, and I guarantee. In all things coaching, I'm really excited to see how he um, takes on his first job at Warrington. Mm. It's, uh, I'm excited for him as a friend. But talking all things league, um, you finish up with the Australian national team. And then you take up a role with the Sydney Roosters. How does that transpire? <laughs> well, I, I met I met uh, Trent in France when he was when I was coaching Stade Francais, which is Paris team. That would have been 2000s and 2010, 11, 11, 12, something like that. And Trent was down in south of France. That's the first time I met him, and I think we got on quite well. We didn't have a lot to do with each other, but then once I came back to Waratahs. You know, we started crossing over a lot more. He was at Roosters and we became good friends. And I think he he extended the opportunity for me to have an opportunity to, to get in there. And, you know, I think there were some things he could see from rugby that he would have liked to see if they could adapt into league. And then I think also he did 
for me as well, you know, like, yeah, let's see, let's, you know, come in. He, you know, I was down after 19, obviously, mm. you know, which is only logical um, because you you want to do your best and when you don't succeed, you you take it to heart. So, but uh, I really enjoyed it. I was, you know, the players, the different um, strategy and tactics involved in the game, learning um, a lot more about a game that I'd love watching, obviously, and played when I was young. I, I, I played league growing up through school all the way through. Um, so it was great to see how it works from the inside and then get involved and get on the field and do some different things. It was it was a great opportunity for me and showed me, taught me a lot of new ideas, gave me new ideas, you know what I mean? That's what I wanted. I wanted to refresh, get better, improve my thought process around footy. Mm. Did it help you see things differently? Definitely, yeah, yeah. And always the last couple of years in 18 and 19 with Australia – too much was dominated by stuff that was happening off the field, you know, clouded too much of what I needed to be focused on, which was on the field and how to get the guys playing better. And I think that going there and back to, you know, a club that's well organised, well run, good management, clear alignment between coach and, and owner and CEO and captain and good good values, you know, I really enjoyed that and it helped me to, you know, just – Get back in. It's the first time I've ever been in a footy team and not been the boss. Like I've been head coach since day one when I've coached footy. So uh, it gave me a total different look at things, you know, in a much more relaxed way. Mm-hmm. And obviously there was no expectation on me to to deliver on on anything that they needed from, um, you know, in the important things on we do. But I was really um, you know, appreciative of how they, you know, they asked my you know, ideas and advice on different things that they thought were important because I think they liked the idea that I could give them a different point of view, like one that wasn't um, already tainted with – not tainted, not, that was already directed in a way of rugby league. I looked at it through a different set of glasses, yeah. you know. So – and then it became, you know, I got to learn more and more and got more involved in the the training and, the you know, learning about the tactics and the good coaching team there obviously. So I've got a good connection with them. Just quickly, you mentioned there about um, your, your final few years at Australia mm. uh, and off-field distractions. Is is, is that to do with um, Israel Folau? Obviously there was the Israel Folau and, um, and my relationship with Raylan Castle mm. as well. And, you know, it just – it wasn't it, – it wasn't aligned. Yeah. You know, we talked about alignment before. And I probably – they brought in some mechanisms there to try to, uh, you know – get on top of that and that's maybe the time where I had to push back and say, oh, you know, you've either got to trust me to do this right or, or you're better off letting me go, you know. But I wanted to, you know, after 15 I really wanted thought I could get 19 right but, again, that was probably a compromise I made and it didn't turn out to be the right one, the right thing to do because we, we still work we – hung, we hung in there as a team but we didn't have the same level of – alignment and commitment as we did in 2015 and that's why we couldn't get the next couple of steps yeah, i think it shows just how important that that is and oh, and even totally. you know I, I believe you were offered uh, or there was an interest in, in you coming into the tigers but looking at the tigers now it seems like the west tigers in rugby league mm. they seem to be more aligned and just even any of the clubs i've i've been at in the past and if they're not aligned, it, no. it, 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 it just it's, – it's hard enough to get wins anyway. Yeah. And, but it just makes – it adds to the degree of difficulty. That's yeah. just totally unnecessary and completely solvable. Well, all the other teams are trying to beat you. You shouldn't yeah. try and beat yourself. Yeah. You know? So that – that and, and, it, and it comes down to the quality of people who are running places, mm. right, to, to be able to see that and then to be able to manoeuvre the different – personalities involved and get them aligned, that's it's really, really crucial. And I feel like it's a strength. And the top clubs have it um, and that's why they've, they've got consistent success. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it builds consistent so. success. It builds consistent success. Yeah. Not for the odd one here or there. Mm. Back onto the league, um, you're at the Roosters, you've got a taste for it. You take on the Lebanese mm. national team coaching job. 
to go to the World Cup. Yeah. How was your experience um, in that campaign? Well, it, I said it at the time. It's one of the best things I've ever done from a sporting point of view because, like, obviously for me it was a different code. I was getting to work with some great coaches who were in the, in the code that I was able to – and then some great players who were playing NRL and, and then some players who were amateurs – and bringing them up to the level that was required to play against New Zealand and Australia and all the teams that we played over there. And at the same time, we had this cultural thing about teaching a lot of the guys more about Lebanon. You know, we had a group of uh, five players that came from Lebanon, uh, two that were in the squad and three that were um, extra, extra that came through a process where we ran over there and they were awesome. Like we, they helped us off the field with or so many things around how the team integrated and became, you know, felt Lebanese, obviously teaching the anthem number one, right? And, mm. and we, did, we did other things we, along the way that helped guys get more connected back to the country uh, that they're playing for understanding that we're most of us are, you know, generational immigrant immigrants from their immigrants. And then we are we had we use the the cedar tree, which is the the symbol, as a real um, central for all of our campaign preparation, our game style, all the things there. We had some we did some really good things around that. And I think the players felt very, very connected underneath that banner and and really enjoyed it. And you can see when they enjoy when you're enjoying your footy, you can do anything, you know. And I thought we had some great games. Like the first game against New Zealand, we played out of our – way above our level. And the game against Ireland was was great for us because most of those guys would have been playing Super League or something like that. So we are able to, to, to do that. And then the game against Australia, even though they blew us away in the first half there, it was still just to be able to front up and go against those guys. It was it was, it was was great. You know, would have liked to play, play a bit better in the first half there. But – um, I feel like it was one of – like for me it was awesome experience. And then I had that mm, unbelievable week where you got to do quarterfinal of the World <laughs> Cup and then a test match against England on the Sunday with Argentina. I was going from Manchester one day to London the next, back up to Manchester, back down to London. I was so lucky like to be – have Argentina who let me do it as yeah. well, which was so awesome. And then obviously the, the the Cedars who helped me with it, you know, the guys were so understanding and it was it was awesome. And Kingy came down with me actually for the test match on the Sunday and to came and hung with us for the day, which was was great having him down there, you know, came on the bench with us and everything like that for the, the rugby test. So it was without a doubt one of the great, you know, experiences. Well, obviously Freddie had coached before, he helped us out you know, in the lead up with, with a lot of things. And there was a really good feeling around the team and the support from the, the Lebanese in Australia and overseas as well to get us there because we had to fund ourselves to get ourselves there, you know. So it was it was great and I really appreciated everything. Like some of the guys were, were, were above and beyond some of the guys who were, you know, going working all day and jobs and then coming to training and doing what we were asking them was pretty awesome. Well, I think there's a couple of things that um, you bringing in players from Lebanon, like the, the effect, the, the ripple on effect that mm. that could have. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be an Argentina, an Italy, a Japan, but who knows with yeah. the right, with, with those little differences or those li little things that you do, uh, they can magnify, especially over time. Um, but bringing, juggling the two jobs together was the right thing. You brought the, the the two cultures together, so you've got um, the the Lebanon squad and and the Argentine squad together in the same room a couple of times. We did. We got. We had dinner. We had a dinner together in Manchester when the World Cup was on. We had a three day camp just before, with Argentina just before, which we're allowed to have before the November series started. So. They come up, and I was sort of flicking between training sessions because we trained at Sail Rugby, I think, for the with the Argentinians, and we had our other training. I'm not sure where we were with the with the with the Cedars. So I was getting it worked. The timing worked out good, and then we had a big dinner together, which um, 
the owner of Warrington helped put on for us. You know what I mean? He's an awesome guy. So Simon Moran, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's a great guy, and he um he, he sort of hooked it up and organised it for us, and it was great. The boys shared a meal together, and you know they they talk with each other and we had all the staff obviously all mixed and shared so we had a great time it was good and i think that's that is a very unique scenario that's not going to happen very often so right. you got to take the opportunity to make it happen it's incredibly special yeah, i can only was, imagine yeah. what the experience is, uh, has done for yourself um the, the lebanon team reading up i forgot about this two robberies <laughs> <laughs> what, what's going on there like right I, I I couldn't say it. like Manchester was I think it was it was crazy that the the whole thing the whole event but like that that night I they were having a massage I think the fellas these guys came and robbed no we got robbed I I went down one morning to the team room and all the equipment was gone so <laughs> I don't know that we we had a big inquisition how did it happen video cameras anyway so the police all came and then the next night. The boys were having a massage. I think the same guys must have come back. We found some of the stuff in a local, in a construction site not far away. And then the next night, I think these, the guy came back or someone came back to, and I just saw, I was downstairs, I just saw them all chasing someone out the street, running up the road off the massage table. So they got the guy, brought him back. Oh, they got, yeah. Did they fill him in or? They, they, the police came, took uh, him away. Did they? No. No, we're, we're a new disciplined outfit there. The Cedars, we're not getting, we're not getting dragged into the emotional <laughs> contest. No, thank God, because you know that CCTV cameras are all outside. You know what I mean? Now that's so, remarkable the strength not to no, give the well, guy a bit of know, a kick in. They brought him back, and of course, then they bring me down. I go, what am I going to yeah. do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call the coppers. So, but uh, mate, I think there was something inside of that. The, those fellas, the they were they were very. Now connected really well, and I think we had a, a huge laugh about it. Obviously, at the end, you know what I mean. But uh, it was, it was, it was a good. It was a real special time, you know. It was, it was. We worked hard to get there. That boys trained hard, and and they learnt a lot as well. And I learnt a lot too from them. And it was good. We had a good coaching team. I had Matt King and and um, and uh, and Robbie Farah, and then we got Tony Ray. I don't know if you know Tony Ray. Tony 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 came over. He's based in London now. I'm good friends with Tony. He's a guy's coach rugby union, rugby league as well. He coached the Brumbies. And he was excellent for us as well. So, and then we, you know, I I had a, we had a guy's here, Johnny George's, Mick Habib, who was coaching Newtown. He's with South now at the time in the junior ranks. They're, you know, they just all committed to helping to get as many players available and, you know, get the spotlight on as many players Mm -hmm. as possible. You know, so it was great. Is there, an, is there an ambition to coach rugby league full time? Well, you'd be lying if you said no, because like it's a sport we're brought up with, and it hasn't been really done. Alan Jones had a go at it, you know, it hasn't been done with any success. I think the idea would not to be just to coach, it would be to coach and succeed, you know. So that challenge is there. Obviously, now I've had a taste for it. I like it. Uh, the, it's there, you know. I don't. I don't think it's something I can go and chase, you know what I mean? I think it's just got to be a scenario that unfolds and I've never cha- you know, I've never sort of organised anything in advance. So it's just a scenario it has got to organise because, like I said before, it's about three-dimensional, right person for the right team, right time, no matter what the game is, you know? And I think that people who, are, who own teams or who run teams, whether they're in league or rugby, they have to really want, want that person, whoever it is, going to be coaching. So I think I'll... Now I've got a bit of time. I'll, you know, I'll maybe look into spending some time again, getting myself ready for the with league, so I can try and get myself ready for twenty six, start the World Cup with with eleven on there, and start building that. We're hoping to get some test matches this year against France at the end of the season. We've been talking to them about trying to to get. A, we were hoping to get a game in Lebanon, but you know, with everything that's going on mm. over there, we'll probably. We're trying to get a couple of games with France. Um, even when when Great Britain, when in England, um, you know, the Samoa thing didn't work out, we tried to talk to them a little bit too because I think that's a great opportunity for us to play test match over there, get the boys together mm. again, give them a chance. When when we can have all our players NRL, we might try and do something in the middle of the year when we don't have our NRL players as well. So um, and keep that for younger players. There's a lot of young Lebanese kids playing in ball and in flag. I want to keep that moving along for them so they can see that there's somewhere for them to play 
you know, with, with inside of the framework of the Cedars. Just on, on on yourself and perhaps the NRL aspirations, do you have a, a manager working for you, having conversations with team owners? And No, no, mate. I've never had a manager in my time as a I, – I feel like – we don't need that, you know. I think that's – it's. I like it to be done organically. Like yeah. the team wants you, they come and ring you up, what do you want to do? That's how it's all, I've always done it, whether it was, it's happened in Ireland when I coach at Leinster um, with my clubs there and in France with Stade Francais and then with the Waratahs happened the same way. It's If you do a good job and you do well, then people want you to go to them and be involved with them. I don't – Never looked. I've only always looked at it that way. Like I said, I've never had even a position lined up before I finished another one in the past. You know, so it's all about doing the best you can with what you got now. And I've, you know, I would have, like I said, I would have liked to maybe come home with the the bronze medal from Argentina. But I was really happy with with how it finished up over the two years and the games that we played. And you know, whatever happens next, hopefully I can be better um, than I was with the last time I you know, coached and that's that's the goal for me. Do you think you could move into an, uh, an assistant role uh, within league or, or you'd be head coach? I, I don't league? think it's my skill set. I think my skill set's leading the Person team. Person in charge, you know? yeah. I mean, like obviously if you've got a connection with someone like I did with Robbo and you know, I know those guys so it was really comfortable for me there and it was good, for, you know, it depends on what capacity too, you know. Yeah. If I'm just learning stuff or going in to do different things but – the, per, the the idea of managing people made them not managing leading people and getting the best out of people that doesn't matter what game it is you know what I mean it's a it's about a skill that you've got about putting the right team together the right staff together the right crew of people to to emulate what the club wants in any club whether it's a union or a league what they want what they want their supporters to look for yeah um well it, it's been a fascinating conversation it's really interesting to to hear a lot of those stories it really is and uh, i've got to see sneaking suspicion we might see you um behind the clipboard of an nrl club in the not too distant never future had a never had a <laughs> uh, but we've got a couple of questions we do for each and every guest uh oh if if uh, if football or rugby didn't exist um what do you think you'd be doing i think you've probably answered that with the fashion yeah so, businessman mate. Business I think man. that's it yeah you know Wheeler and dealer, you know mm. how it is. I like to get out and about, do a few deals. And I love that whole, you know, maybe corporate, something like that one day would be mm. interesting, you know, to be in charge of a big organisation and see. But look, you know, I think, like I said, one day when I grow up, I'll work out what I'm going to do for a job. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, the most interesting person you've met along the way? That's tricky. There's, there's a lot of, so many people I've met you know, over the time. But I, I reckon... I won't say from interesting from maybe the conversation, but I was when I did a an exec ed thing at Stanford leadership thing, and they had a guy there called Kevin Walsh, who is a he was a he was a deputy to the a guy called Bernanke, who was in charge of the Fed in the US when the GFC happened, right? And they started printing money and all that stuff. What the reason why it was interesting for me was to hear him speak. He's an alumni, so he came back and spoke at the course, and then we got to ask questions. What it showed me was that we look up to all these people who are in high positions and think they have the some superpower to make things right, but they don't. Right? They're just making it up as they go along, like everybody else, you know. And I think that that should give us, as people from the, the street the confidence to make strong decisions and good decisions in everything because that those people who are supposedly in the big positions, whether they're politicians or I've met lots of whatever, they're just doing their best like we are. Mm. And we should made me be much more confident to back myself, you know what I mean, when it came to big decisions. I like that. I like that thinking. I like that that frame of mind. Yeah, I like because I asked him, I asked the, the question the, about yeah. why did you guys start printing money? Because you know that, that I don't know if you ever want to get into all that stuff. Because that's what they started doing: printing money, quantity of easing. Why did you do it? You guys are all supposed to be economic. Mm. You know it's going to create inflation, and and he said they pretty much said, well, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what else to do. So when you've got go. the, when you've got the lives of so many yeah. millions of people basically and in your hands, or exactly. more the financial, which obviously has implications to. Huge, huge. And it showed me that 
you shouldn't be afraid to make decisions because that's what – and we shouldn't expect any different. Same with politicians, you know. Mm. They're just people making decisions and we as people on the street shouldn't be looking up saying, oh, well, they're in better position to make decisions than we are. Well, everyone's in, in, capable of making decisions for themselves on the street. You get, arm yourself with the right information and do the, do what's necessary for the you know, the, your own life, the importance of your own life. Uh, final question, um, a sliding doors moment you think about maybe and – Maybe mm. think about the alternative happening. Sliding doors, mate. Yeah, maybe if I didn't, what well, I would the sliding doors for me would have been if I decided to go down the like the pro route of footy when I was playing institute yeah. of sport and all that. Could have ended up very different to how I've ended up now, where it comes to coaching and business and all those types of things. I could have ended up being going down different. And I went there and did the the test and everything. I made that. It was that moment where I said, "No, you know what? I'm just gonna." go back and do what I've been doing, you know what I mean? And I'll see what happens from there. Is, is there a level of regret at all about not definitely, pu- pushing your Yeah, look, definitely. I, I, mate, often I'd say to the the boys, in particular for Australia, obviously, and also with Argentina when I was coaching, is that I can tell you how valuable it is to play for your country. You know, I'd be the <laughs> person most in, in the best position to tell you how important it is and how great it is because I never did it. You understand? Mm, when do. you haven't I done get it, what you mean. the value of it is there. And you, you, yeah, well, I would have given anything to play for Australia, you know. So, yeah, I, I, there, yes and no, because I'm very happy with, yeah, with you, my, you don't you know, know what would have transpired. Yeah, exactly. but, but I'm very happy with what's happened. Mm. Yeah, regardless. Yeah. Well, Michael Checker, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank I think you. I, I know a little bit, don't know a lot. I've been hanging off your every word, so thank you for for sharing that story. It's, I found you uh, really interesting, fascinating character, and um, I like those type of people that have that mindset, openness to learning. Um, I think I've learned a lot myself from from sat here no, sitting across from you. So thank no, you I've so enjoyed much. It. Thank you. Yeah.